what is love and have I loved anyone? When we talk about the subject of love, we associate it with love with emotional attachment. That is what we think love is. It's got to do something with emotions. And sometimes love is being idealized. The movies that we read, the novels, and the stories that we come up about, you know, and we associate with emotional declarations as a result of which people try to look for love from outside ourselves. And they do not know how to tap the potential that lies within. But what we don't expect is love can be so simple and it can be available all the time. In fact, at the BGF, we have what we call the Meta Meditation that has been going on weekly on every Wednesday since 1997. I think 1997, and this is year two, two, uh, 2019. How many years is that? I think it's down to 23 years, right? 22, 23 years. So we have been running Metta here for 23 years, the practicing of loving-kindness meditation, using loving-kindness as a form of meditation. And uh, love is not a prize to be won by some lucky ones. Some people think, oh, you know, you must be the lucky ones to have love. Other people get into love and they fall out of love, right? But love is not really like that. Matter is not like that. Now, when we begin to talk about love, there are really four components of this. Uh, the Buddhists call this uh, Brahma Vihara, uh, the abodes from Brahma. If you could actually have your minds on these four divine states, divine abode, it is as if you are a Brahma. You are no longer at the human being, human plane. Human plane, we are tied down with human feelings human emotions, but if you could lift yourself up and to have your mind on matter, which is loving kindness, universal, universal friendliness, karuna is compassion, mudita is altruistic joy. This is the joy that you get when other people are happy. That's what you mean, altruism. Altruism is that sense of getting happiness from the happiness of others. And upeka is equanimity, but for Venerable Thich Nhat Hanh, he will use the word inclusiveness for Upeka. Now let us first go through Metta. Metta, the Sanskrit word for Metta is Maitri. Uh, in the Karana Metta Sutta, the Living Kindness Sutta, it says cultivating a boundless heart to all beings, like the way a mother would protect her only child at the risk of her life. Do you think that mothers will do that? If a mother has the only child, and when the child is danger, it was in danger, do you think the mother is prepared to sacrifice her life for, uh, for the child? And you see all the ladies are nodding their heads. <laughs> because women, uh, ladies know that when it comes to the child, a woman, uh, she might be very docile, and you know, she actually become a tigress, become very fierce, just to protect her, her offspring. And the Buddha used this analogy in the Korean Metasutta just to show the power of love. Because the, the mother's love, one of our members is going, expecting a child. <laughs> Jack, if you know Jack, Jack Tan, uh, the child is a bit overdue. So he says that maybe the baby might be born on West Sunday or the day after, I do not know. Yeah. But you know, the baby is in the mother's womb for nine months. And so the mother carries the babies and later on the baby will start moving. Huh? inside the stomach and the mother knows the presence of the baby and the baby is very much alive. Whatever she does, all is thinking about the welfare of the baby. And when the baby comes out, no need to fall in love already. Mother already felt fallen in love because the baby was with her for nine months. It's inside her and she feels the baby inside. And therefore, in the, the Buddha's analogy of what we mean by loving kindness, is like the way the mother would protect her only child at the risk of her life. Yes. Like the baby is really part of her, really. Yeah. And um, so this is the kind of love that we should have, universal friendliness, loving kindness for all beings without discrimination. This is a quality of love. Because when the mother loves the baby, it's not that she expects the baby to give her something back in return. Actually, the baby needs taking care of, cleaning, feeding, so many things. Huh? Looking up, worrying about the baby, but she doesn't want anything from the baby, nothing. It's just the sheer presence that the baby brings her so much happiness. So that is the quality of matter the love that you have for all living beings. And the practice of this loving kindness is to overcome hatred and ill will. So if there's a lot of anger, hatred and ill will, the practice of loving kindness is the way that we cleanse our emotions, negative emotions, 
with the practice of loving kindness with my tree. Uh, as quotations from the Dhammapada, uh, sometimes we recite, uh, there are eight stanzas of the Dhammapada in the Buddha Puja book, that sometimes we recite uh, selections of Dhammapada. It says that hatred is not overcome by hatred, hatred is overcome by love. This is an eternal rule. And the Buddha gave this rule to two women who were fighting with one another. Uh, one woman trying to kill the baby of another woman. And though they ran, she ran to the Buddha for help. You know, pursued by this other woman. And actually the Buddha began to relate the past lives of these two women. Actually in their past life, they have been killing each other's babies. And it goes on from life to life. And only when the Buddha started explaining why they are in that kind of situation, why they're bound, bound in that kind of situation, they suddenly realize that, oh, you know, we've been doing this for so many lives. We brought suffering to each other. Why don't we put it to an end? Instead of hatred, let us have love. That's what the Buddha says, okay? And uh, another stanza from the Dhammapada says, overcome the angry by non-anger, overcome the wicked with goodness. Therefore, using non-anger as a way, as a device, as a, as a way of overcoming anger. Tinyahan, we will hear from him later. And I think his definition of love is fantastic. He says, true love makes you happy and makes the other person happy. How easy to understand. That is what it is. It is not a love based on selfishness. It's not a love for myself. Love for me. You have to give me that kind of love. That is not true love. True love is the love that, that makes you happy and makes the other person happy. That's true love. And he also says that if you are a true lover, you create a happiness for yourself and for the others. All right? So this is the practice of metta. And of course, in the Pali stanzas, in the practice of loving kindness, we have the Pali words to say, Avira hontu, abhyapaja hontu, aniga hontu, suki atana pariharantu. Uh, you know the first album of Imi Ui? was chanting stanzas from this uh, sutra. It's not a sutra, it's a, well, it's a chanting on, on, on a matter. And uh, at the PGF, we use these stanzas to say, um, may your heart be peaceful and free, may your mind be happy, may your body be healthy, may you be well and happy. While this is not a direct translation of the Pali word, because the, when Partly when you translate it into English, it becomes a bit odd. You know, like uh, for instance, when you say, Avirahontu, it says, uh, May you be free from enmity. May you be free from uh, uh, mental suffering. May you be free from physical suffering. Uh, may you look after yourself happily. So when we do metta, we find it's a bit hard. When you do metta, you think about suffering, suffering, suffering. So it's better to put it in a positive term. May your heart be peaceful and free. Open up your heart and set it free. May your mind be happy. May your body be healthy. May you be well and happy. So this is the method that we use uh, for our cultivation, for our practice. First you send loving kindness to yourself and then you send it to others. The second quality uh, is what we call karuna or compassion. What is karuna? Karuna is the wish to remove or even to reduce the suffering of others. You see, in the case of matter, you're just wishing everybody well-being and happiness, having happiness in the mind, happiness in the body. But karuna is when you're in a situation when you actually see suffering, and your heart quivers when you see other beings suffering, and you just want to relieve them from their suffering. You do not want them to suffer so much. If possible, not at all. And the practice of karuna is to overcome selfishness and cruelty. All right. Sometimes human beings, they like to be cruel because sometimes they derive some kind of pleasure from seeing other people being suffer. Right? Sometimes you see leaders doing this, <laughs> creating suffering for their own people. Right? Karuna is a practice that you do not want others to suffer so much. You say, may your suffering be relief. May you be happy. Uh, that's a practice of karuna. And we know that this Kuan Yin, this is a very powerful symbol for, for the Chinese. And Kuan Yin is a bodhisattva for compassion. You see that Kuan Yin comes with many hands, a thousand hands Kuan Yin. Each of our hands will carry an implement. Because the promise of Kuan Yin is to answer all cries 
and pleased of all sentient beings in order to liberate them, to free them from suffering. Many of this suffering come from karmic, karmic uh, consequences. Uh, uh, Avalokiteshwara is a Sanskrit name. Avalokiteshwara. He who hears the cries of the world, the voice, Swara, of the world. The being that hears the cries of the world and responds to the world. This Avalokiteshwara. So Kuan Yin has this uh, vow that if you call her with a sincere heart, she will try to relieve you and appears in a form that is most suitable for your situation. Right? So this is, this is uh, taking compassion to, to another level, to cultivate compassion as a, as, a, as a parami. For you to become a Buddha, you have to practice ten paramis. This is practicing the quality of, of love, true love, as a parami. The Dhammapada says that all tremble at violence. Life is precious to all. Putting oneself in the place of another, one should not kill or cause another to kill. All right? So uh, uh, that is why we practice the first precept. Sometimes when we live the life of a human being, we have no choice but sometimes to take the life of, of other human beings, other beings. Yeah? Our life is built on a mountain of lives. But as we live a Buddhist life, can we try to reduce the suffering of other beings? Try, can we try as far as possible not to cause other living beings to suffer? And this is what we mean by the practice of karuna. And advice from Tinyahan, you'll hear him later. He says, compassion is a capacity to make yourself suffer less and help other people to suffer less as well. Yeah. What a nice way of putting it. Tinyahan has a way. Tinyahan is a Zen, Zen, uh, Zen teacher. He's able to put it so simply and so easy to understand. Compassion, the capacity to make yourself suffer less. And also to make other people suffer less as well. The third uh, divine quality is the practice of altruistic joy or mudita. Mudita is a bit strange because this is something that people find it very hard to practice, especially if you tend to be competitive. Uh, you have people who are very competitive, especially in the business world. They cannot see other people trying to do better than them. They want you to see it way down. And they do not want you to succeed. Yeah? And you know there are some leaders that are currently doing that now. Some very powerful leaders. Uh, this actually is the mental state of what we call an asura, of a demon. Because a demon is actually very competitive. And they, they are always very jealous, very competitive. The practice of altruistic joy is to overcome this envy and jealousy and to develop the kind of happiness of others. So when others are successful, that we also develop the joy and happiness Instead of feeling a sense of envy, a sense of deprivation, we rejoice in the happiness of others. And this is also another way of making merits. That is why in Buddhist, in the Buddhist practice, when you come and do dana, you make merits, so people say sadhu to you. But when other people do dana, you say sadhu, you also make merits because you rejoice when other people make merits. Yeah? So this is altruistic joy. As a quotation from Dhammapada, it says that should you find a good companion to walk with and who is steadfast and upright, you should walk with him with joy so as to overcome all dangers. And this is the importance of having good friends. Wrong friends can mislead us, good friends can put us on the path of uprightness. And uh, for us to make progress in everything, we need good friends, actually. Good friends to encourage you, to advise you, to warn you of dangers to help to put you on the right track. And that is how, uh, that is how we grow, actually. Uh, actually, a lot of the knowledge that we get also from friends, that we learn from them. Opportunities come from friends. Yeah. They open the doors of so many things. Of course, our parents are the first. Yeah. They even teach us how to tie our shoelace, how to button our clothes, how to wash ourselves. Basic things, how to feed ourselves, how to speak well, how to be respectful. Yeah. And, uh, but we also learn a lot from our friends. So having good companionship is a way that we can do joy, uh, uh, good meritorious deeds together and, joy and rejoice. Um, another one, uh, this is also from Dhammapada for a fault-finding uh, person. The fault of others is easily seen, but one's own fault is difficult to see. Yeah, yeah. From Tinyahan, he says, this, If love does not generate joy, it is not love. 
If love makes the other person cry every day, that is not love. If love makes you suffer every day, that's not true love. And I've got a picture of a dragon here. This dragon comes from the capital of uh, Slovenia, called Ljubljana. It's on the bridge. So you've got four dragons like that, fierce. So if your love is like that, that's not true love. Yeah? Love is something that, that, that creates joy. And finally, equanimity or upeka. Um, this is to be able to look with some kind of impartiality without being too, uh, uh, too emotional uh, when you have attachment or aversion. Okay? Not to be too emotional. This is to overcome emotional turbulence that can arise from gains or loss, fame and ill fame, praise and blame, happiness and pain. A quotation from Dhammapada says, Retaliate not, be silent as a cracked gong when you are abused by others. If you do so, I deem that you have already attained Nibbana, although you have not realized Nibbana. And Ting Yahan, he uses inclusiveness. He says, if in true love, you don't see the frontier between the one who loves and the one who is loved. Dear Sangha, I was wondering if you could speak to us um, of love. What is the essence of true love and how do we connect to that in us? True love is something that helps you to suffer less and help the other person to suffer less. True love is something that makes you happy and make the other person happy. True love is something it can help you to be to, to have freedom, more freedom. And in the teaching of the Buddha, there are four elements of true love. The first is uh, Maitri, it means uh, loving kindness. Maitri has the power to offer happiness. When you are able to generate a feeling of joy and happiness to you, that's, that's true love. Offer to yourself. And if you can generate a feeling of joy and happiness and helping the other person generate a feeling of joy and happiness, that is uh, loving kindness. That is true love. So if you are a true lover, you can create happiness for you and for him, for her. And according to our teaching, it's not so difficult to create joy and happiness. Just breathe in and recognize the many conditions of happiness and joy that are already available. Generating joy, generating happiness for you and for the other person. The second element of true love is uh, compassion, karuna. That is the capacity to make yourself suffer less and help the other person suffer less. And we have learned that uh, there is an art of suffering. If we know how to suffer, we suffer much, much less. And uh, we can make good use of suffering in order to to fabricate uh, understanding and love. And you can help the other person to suffer less, to transform suffering in her, in him. And that is the second element of true love, compassion, karuna. The Buddha is able to help people to suffer less. And his uh, compassion is great called Maha Karuna, Great Compassion. And as we continue to practice, our Karuna continues to grow. And one day it will be Maha Karuna, Maha Maitri and Maha Karuna. And then the third element of true love is a joy, Mudita. If love does not generate joy, it's not love. 
If love makes the other person cry every day, it's not love. <laughs> if love makes you suffer every day, that's not true love. So true love is capable of generating joy for yourself and for the other person. And in the last uh, four days, we have learned how to produce a feeling of joy. And the fourth element of true love is uh, upeksha, inclusiveness. In true love, you don't see any frontier between the one who loves and the one who is loved. It's like bowing to the Buddha, the one who bow and the one who is bow to. Between them, there is no frontier. And that is why communication is perfect. So in true love, your suffering is her suffering. Your happiness is her happiness. There is no individual suffering and happiness anymore. No discrimination or inclusive is, uh, is uh, the fourth element of true love, equanimity, that can be translated as uh, inclusiveness. And you begin with yourself and the other person. But if you continue with this practice of true love, your heart will open, grow, and very soon you will include all of us in your love. You do not uh, exclude any one, anything from, 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 from your love. That is the love of the Buddha, including every living being, not excluding anyone. No discrimination about uh, uh, race, uh, citizenship, religion, or anything. And that is uh, the element of non-discrimination. That is the element of inclusiveness. And that makes you very free, very happy, and make your love unlimited. And in true love, you continue to grow. Your love continues to grow until it, it, uh, it embraces everyone in the cosmos. So Tunyahan makes us realize that we can actually practice true love we begin with ourselves and then the other person and when we open up our hearts and to grow it it will include everyone else in your love uh, that is the love without discrimination of the Buddha for every living being so on Wednesday let us think about the love and compassion of the Buddha that actually brings us together right? and uh, this is unlimited love is the basis of so much happiness let us practice love, true love in our lives. With that, I would like to thank all of you and a happy Wesak.